Another exciting edition of Hall of Fame is upon us. My name is AJ Akwako Sapon, and welcome to the show that gets up close and candid with some of your favorite personalities, allowing them to show a different side you may already or otherwise may not know about them. Right here on the show, it's uh, coming to you live from the City TV studios here in Adabraka. And I'm going to be having a conversation with a very amazing woman, someone I, I call my friend who is truly outstanding in every single thing that she does. But before I tell you who it is, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Hall of Fame. You're tuned into Hall of Fame right here on Tini TV. My name is AJ Akwako Sapon. And my guest today is someone, what me and her meet up is always bands, a lot of laughter and generally good vibes. She is an outstanding actress. She is an accomplished uh, producer when it comes to stage production. She does it all and has uh, 360 production house called April Communications. Not only that, that does she able to combine um, uh, TV and, and radio and uh, production and acting, she also juggles being an amazing wife and a wonderful mother to two amazing sons. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Na Ashoko Bensadoku is in the studio. Woo, 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 woo. It's nice to have you here, Na. Wow, thanks for all the kind words. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's you. You, I don't know how you have 24 <laughs> hours that we all do and you manage to do so much within that time, but it's always good to have you. I, and it's nice to have you. Finally, I get to interview you. I know, I and know. I'm <laughs> shaking. <laughs> this will be the very first time, right? First time ever <sighs> that I get to interview you. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's going to be cool. It's going to be a chilled one. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start it off from the beginning. I want to know how it was like as now Shoko growing up, how was your childhood like? Really cool. Okay. I'm the second of four girls. Okay. So, you know, a lot of talking <laughs> and arguing and, <laughs> and all of that. Um, I'm Dan, so I'm from Teshing. Um, I grew up in Teshing all of my childhood. I literally did not know anywhere outside of Teshing, Labadi, Nungwa <laughs> until I went to secondary school. Really? Yeah, when I got out, you know, I went to the Eastern region. So I'm, I'm a Teshi girl through and through. Um, I went to a community preparatory school in Teshi, Daras Preparatory School. I went to Sunday school at the Church of Pentecost wow. in Teshi, Victory Assembly. Um, my, my dad worked from home as a child. My mom worked, uh, my mom is a market. Um, so my mom is a businesswoman. She has businesses in Makola. So yes, that's the furthest I went. Okay. To Makola. And even that, I didn't go so often because I had this, uh, what do you call it nowadays? So it is, uh, some kind of claustrophobia. So when I go out to, to crowded places, I get sick. And then I vomit no. and I get sick. Yes. Yeah, so I it didn't go very often. <laughs> Every once in a while, I got the chance to go. Okay. So, so yeah, my sisters and I are pretty close. Um, we are very alike in a lot of ways, and we're close in age also. Well, two to three years apart. Okay. So we, we just all grew up together. So my childhood was good, fun. <laughs> um, my parents were strict, so, uh, you know, a lot of discipline. I can imagine. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, how was it, uh, or how did you enter, or what was your introduction into the media and acting and all that? Did you always want to be someone who was out on the spotlight, and how did you find your way into it? I don't think so. Um, I liked seeing Gifty Auntie on TV, and I thought, oh, that's a really nice job to have. <laughs> but I wouldn't say it was the plan, plan, plan from the beginning. But you know what they say? All that we are are the results of things that we have thought of, thought about. So growing up, I wanted to be a lawyer, right? So it was at the back of my head, that was the plan. Um, I'd say my interest for being out there might have been whipped up in secondary school. Mm. when So in JSS, I'll say I was very um, laid back, um, quite... I kept to myself a lot, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but in secondary school... <clears throat> So I'll tell you something about my JSS. My JSS was, say, one of the best preparatory schools in Teshing at the time. Mm -hmm. So there were lots of cool kids in my school. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. At that school, you know, we had cool kids and everybody was very competitive. And um, so everyone was challenged to do more, do more, do more. Yeah. Right? And actually at some point in GH JHS, we were separated into classes A, B, and C, where A was awesome students, top really? of the class. Oh, wow. okay. And I think B was below average, and C was average. 
So that's the kind of school I went to. So you knew those who were great, and it was very competitive. And I think I was average. Mm. I think I was in the C class for average. So I never considered myself anything. Like I just did my schoolwork. I went to school. I stayed out of trouble <laughs> and just, just did what I had to do. But when I went to secondary school, you know how secondary school is. There are people from everywhere. All walks of life were different people. It was in secondary school that I found that I could do this. I can do that. I like GSS where everyone was so competitive that it, it could have been difficult to just identify right. what you're good at. So in secondary school, um, I was my class secretary. Okay. I was voted for as class secretary on the first day of school. And I wondered why, because I had never gotten any position or anything in my GSS because everybody's like, I'm out there already, I tell you. So I was like, wow, okay, me, me, <laughs> okay, all right, great. <laughs> and then in Form 3, I was voted for as uh, the SRC vice president wow. and the regional, was the regional secretary, zonal secretary, something. And so as I progressed, I realized that I could, I was articulate. I realized that, oh, I think I speak well a little bit. Oh, I think I have some confidence that I never knew I did okay. have. So, you know, I began to discover things about myself. And then people started telling me things. So I entered a school debate competition and I represented my school. And one for my school, one for the zone, one for the, what do you call it? The, so one for my school, one for district, zone, and so on. So we just kept winning. Wow. And I began to just improve upon my public speaking. And it was after that that I vied for SRC vice president and I won and, then, and so on. So then I realized, hmm, there's probably something there. I think so. Something, something. <laughs> so, so after school, no, while I was in Form 3, a bunch of girls just came up to me and said, we think you should represent a school for Mr. and Ms. S's. I was like, what is that? They said, oh, it's a talent competition where, you know, students from secondary school go. And I'm like, that's me? Why me? They're like, because you this, you're that. And I'm like, I am? Okay. okay. <laughs> I give it a shot. So that's where it started. You know, I went for Mr. and Ms. S's. I was third. And I didn't even think I'll be ninth. Wow. So, here's the thing. My mother taught us never to say no to any good opportunity. It's a good opportunity. Say yes. If you do it, you don't succeed. You know you tried and you know so it's not for me. Mm -hmm. But you just might succeed and then mm. you continue on and on. So I've been guided by these words and I never really say no when, unless it's, it's um, not in line with my morals or like my stance on life. So I'll probably just say yes and just try it. If it doesn't work, okay, it didn't work. Mm. It's not for me. But it just might work out. It just might. So I went to did Mr. and Mrs. as I was dead. And then everybody was happy, like my sisters, my dad. So then I was like, hmm. <laughs> Something is there. Something just might be there. So I went to GIJ. And with the same attitude, every time people from TV stations came around to do Vox Bobs. And everyone was right now with me. I don't want to do that. Like, me, 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 me. <laughs> can I, can I, can I? So TV Africa came by a lot of times. And a lot of times... I volunteered my services to them. So I was in every box pop. Wow. And my dad would tell everybody and everybody watch the news so that they see me uh -huh. for five seconds on TV, on some box pop, on something I probably knew nothing about. <laughs> so that's how it started. And then I struck an acquaintance with a crew from TV Africa. I was the one that recruited people for them now when they came looking for people for box pops. Wow. And then they invited me as a guest on one of their shows. And that's where it all started from. So it's, it's basically just been an attitude of, let me try, let me try, let me try. I didn't have a perfect plan in my mind. I just kept trying. Wow. Now, how did becoming a Vox Pop coordinator <laughs> <laughs> go to becoming a show host on TV Africa and subsequent uh, hosting on various channels? So how do you make that transition and how difficult was it balancing GI at that point in time and also doing TV Africa? Well, I remember that time I was about 17 or 18. Um, they called me to come on a, a youth platform called New Generation. In fact, it was on New Generation Vox Pops that I was featuring a lot. Mm. And after some time, somebody at TV Africa noticed me and said, who is this girl who's always in your Vox Pops? She's giving you guys by you like you are jokes. <laughs> and then they said, you should let her come on the show sometime. So the, the producer director of the show at the time, Newman, New Blitz, Komi, said, oh, now, why don't you come on our show? At that time, everybody called me Nisi. Why don't you come on our show? And then I went on the show. And it was great. And they said, you should come again. 
and I okay. went. And it was great. So I went about three times. And the third time, the host of the show had exams and she was ill or something like that. So she didn't show up. And the guests were there and the people were upset. I remember I was on that show with Harold Amenia, the actor, Harold, uh, uh, yeah, actor Harold. So, so they were like, Charlie, one of you have to do it. Wow. Because the show has to go. It was a th we're recording on Thursday and it airs on Friday. So somebody, it has, something has to be done and the editing must be done for the show to go the next day. So me, 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 <laughs> as usual. <laughs> so yeah, I volunteered my amateur services and it was awful. Oh, wow. Yeah. The show ran for about 30 minutes on TV and we recorded for over seven hours. We recorded into the night. Wait, what? Yes. I, it was just awful. It was terrible. And... But we recorded it. Wait, a 30 minute show took seven hours yeah, shooting. We, we, just, we just kept going. People got tired. The crew got angry. The camera people said, don't shoot again. <laughs> that day was a very. But me, I was just sitting there. If you don't want me to do it anymore, I'll go. But as long as you're asking me to do it, we'll continue to do it until we get it. So, wow. And the director had time. So we just went on and on. I tell you what, when it came on TV, it was great. Huh. And. I couldn't even believe that I didn't even tell anyone to watch that episode because I knew it wasn't good. But it came on TV and it was good. So they called me again. Uh -huh. Obviously, the one who makes the decisions was not there at the time of the recording and didn't see all of it. Exactly. So I went again <laughs> and that's how it started. So after a few times, the lady came back for her show. I was given my own show. I was given another show. I was given a 10 minute slot at first. Then I was given a 30 minute slot. I was given an hour slot and then I was given two shows. Wow. So that's how I progressed at TV Africa. Now, how did you move from being uh, Nisreen to Nashoko? So at TV Africa, you have to use a local name. Okay. So... That's just how it started. So at TV Africa, you have to use a local name. Everybody on TV Africa uses local names, local outfits, local hairdo. So that's how it started. Yeah. They didn't even consult me. Wow. They just put my name out there <laughs> because they knew me after some time. They knew my name. So it started off as Na because she's gone. Just, just put Na. And then I was like, well, if you're going to... So they used Na for a while. And it was just Na. And then they said, you know, you can just have Na. It's just too small. You need to add your surname or something. I said, you know, guys, my name is actually Ashoko. <laughs> if you want my local name, it's Ashoko. Because Na is just a general. Yes. Every, every girl woman is probably Na too. So there's Na Shele, Na Ashoko. So there's Na everything. So they just the, added it. Na Ashoko. And then that's just how it started. And I really like my local name, by the way. Hmm. So I was happy to use it. A lot of people in my life at the time didn't know it. Um, thing is, I'm from Teshing, and most of my female cousins, a lot of my female cousins are Ashoko too, because Ashoko is basically just a second girl. Okay. So if we, when I go to my family house, Ashokos are many. <laughs> so we have different ways we call it. So my family call me Koko, oh. and then there's Shosho, and then there's, there's different things. <laughs> so, yeah. So I was happy to finally get to use Ashoko uh -huh. as my own on TV. Okay. And that's how it started. Now... Describe your progression from TV um, Africa into other stations and eventually to, um, I, I don't, did the transition go from straight from TV Africa to Chatter House, which became Yeah, G4? so you know Chatter House is just next door to mm -hmm. TV Africa. And so I used to visit Chatter House a lot because I had friends there. Okay. Um, my husband at the time worked at Chatter House. So I used to go there. Um, it's just... Right by, yeah. Stage. We used to go buy beans across the street. Mm -hmm. So at lunchtime, I go there to eat beans with Chatterhouse um, people. So I was on TV Africa, and then um, Yola Yade called me once, um, asked me to come see him. And he was like, Hey, how is, what do you feel about doing something else, you know, on TV? I said, yeah, I'd like to do something else on TV. He said, yeah, I think you should do more. So Chatter House at the time was a content production company. It wasn't a TV station. So they, were, they produced all sorts of content. They produced guests who's coming for dinner, Miss Malaika, It Takes Two, and all those shows. So I thought, yay, this would be fun. <laughs> so, yeah. So I went over, had some conversations, and they said, uh, they invited me to host the show that Doreen Ander hosted at the time. Guess who's coming for dinner? Mm. That, that one show that I still up to now would say is the most impactful thing that I, I the most impactful TV show that I've had to do because it touches lives and it puts smiles on people's faces. Yep. Like you should be there. You should see people come home and they say, you know, you have a long day and life is so hard, stress, and you come home and there's a surprise meal laid out for you yep. with your favorite celebrity, whoever they might be, 
and we always get them. People break down, people cry, people feel appreciated. Sometimes it's just that little act of kindness. Yeah. And so that show, it was my heart and soul. And it took all of my time. Yeah. And so I couldn't be, I couldn't be at TV Africa as I would have liked to. And I had been at TV Africa for about three years by then. So it was time to try new things. Wow. Now, uh, a little birdie told me that you had tried out once for Miss Malaika. Yes. And I tell you. Describe so when I, was at TV, I was, when I was at TV Africa, right? <laughs> when I was at, at G, uh, uh, GIJ, Miss Malaika scouts came around. Mm. They were like, you should definitely audition for Miss Malaika. I said, me? They said, yes, you. I said, okay, why not? As usual. <laughs> so I filled out my form, went to flash photos, took some pictures, hey. and then I was to go for the audition. That a few, I think, days on, my grandmother passed. Wow. And the day of the audition was a day of her funeral. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother, she was really good to me. You know, when I was in secondary school, she had nothing. She sold kinky at Tema Newtown. But any time anyone was coming to the Eastern region, she would send them bread or three CDs or four CDs to bring to me at school. Wow. And that was like so, like I valued it so much. So I really held her close to my heart. And so she had passed and the funeral was on the day of the audition. My mother was like, you know what? We are all going to be at the funeral. So you just go. It's okay. You can come the next day because, you know, the church service the next day and all that. So that day, I wasn't in the best of moods. And, but, well, so I decided to go for the audition. I took a taxi with two guys who robbed me. <gasps> they took my phone, my bag, pretty much everything, wow. and pushed me out of the taxi on the University of Ghana, Okonglo Road. So it was a rough day for me. And I had to walk from Mukonglo to Irata, I think it was Irata Hotel at the time. In my high heels, I didn't even have slippers. At the time, I didn't know that when you wear high heels, you have, you to, have put, to put slippers in you your have bag. To have slippers. <laughs> so I wore my high heels and walked. It was a dusty road then. When I arrived at audition, it just wasn't on. Wow. It just wasn't on. So I went in. Jessica was on the panel. Yeah, I remember. It wasn't good. I was near tears. You know, I had already cried a few times and I arrived seeing all these girls who are looking looking so fly, cars dropping them off. I had walked from Okonglo and I didn't even have money to go back. I didn't even have a phone to call my family to let them know what had happened. In fact, I had nothing. Right. Wow. I remember it was Kwesi at Chatterhouse at the time. Kwesi in accounts. He is the one I went to see. And Daniel Kwashiga, because while I was at GIJ, I also worked as an usher for the National Theatre. Mm. So I ushered concert party and all those shows. So a lot of times I saw Daniel Kwashiga at the National Theatre because he was a camera crew. Yes. He was a member of the camera crew and they did a lot of work because of VGMAs and the rest at the National, National Theatre. Theater. So I recognized him and I went to him and asked if I could use his phone to call home and let them know what had happened. So it wasn't a great day for me. And I didn't make it. I didn't think I would. So that was my Miss Malaika story. Two years later, guess who was the host? Wow. Hey. Me. Oh, my Hosting goodness. Hosting the show with my little story at the back of my head. So when the girls come around and they don't make it and they cry, it just reminds me of my story. And I tell them, look, everything happens. Everything that happens is good. Perhaps if I had gone through Malaika... I don't know where I would have been Mm -hmm. by now. My path would have probably just gone. So all things that happen in your life all come together for good the way it has to happen. So don't beat yourself up. I always tell the girls, don't be, it's, 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 it's happening the way it's supposed to happen. Wow. It's okay. So that's my Malaika story. And, and now I'm a judge. Now you are a she judge. She was the winner. <laughs> <laughs> I love this whole progression. But I also used to hear that you used to walk to TV Africa. Oh, who told you all of this? No, I, actually, I, I must confess that it, we actually have had a uh, conversation oh, I told about you that. It. And I just want the world to know. I'll tell you. So when I was at GIJ, I was a hustler. I had no money. So my salary at TV Africa at the time was 300 CDs. Mm. And that 300 CDs went into my clothes, my hair. And I had to save to buy a car. Mm. So, how do you stay under cities for all this? Can you imagine? You have to walk sometimes. Hi. So, I used to walk. At first, I used to walk from GIJ to police headquarters. Then I'll take a trotro to circle and walk to TV Africa. But there were times when I didn't have any money. Like, zero. Mm. Zero money. So, you know the back road to Ridge? You pass the back road. It walks worse, 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 
all the way to circle. I, I, I've done that a couple of times, but I had people with me, so we all just walked it. It's long. It's far. It's, I don't know. Yes. If, I don't remember, but it's far. So yeah, I've had to walk to TV Africa a few times, and but there was no day that I took taxi to TV Africa. Even when I had some money, I would walk to police headquarters, take a trot, take trot, or get down at the circle. Um, round at that time, it was a roundabout, and then walk from circle to TV Africa, or I would walk from GIJ to Ridge, you know, and That's then right. take a trot, and then get down. There, there, there's this. Um, Van that goes to a place called, yeah, what's it called? I've forgotten. It's around TV Africa. So we sit in it and then get down there and walk back to TV Africa. So as for my TV Africa days, I walked a lot. I got fit, you know. I can't That's where I got that, my love for fitness from. <laughs> so I got really fit. I never put on weight when I was at TV Africa. So you would do all that work and then polish up and then sit down oh, and yeah, present fun a show. You know the trick? Yeah. You put fun ice in ice in handkerchief, uh -huh. right? Fun eyes. Uh -huh. you put it in the handkerchief uh -huh. the whole time. Okay. Like, never take it out. Okay. When the fun eyes melt, uh -huh. you use the handkerchief to wipe your face. Oh, wow. It's like being in an air conditioned room. <laughs> like, your face will just breathe. <laughs> so, so, just wrap it or eyes block, whatever. But fun eyes, because it's already in the bag. Uh -huh. right? Wrap it around your handkerchief or face towel and keep it. Right? Keep it, keep it. When I arrive at TV Africa, I never go into the building. I sit at the security post for like 10 minutes. Relax. Clean my feet because it was dusty. Clean my feet, straighten my dress, then the fan eyes hanky, uh -huh. wipe my face dry. Oh my god. And your face will feel like you've been in an air conditioned room. And then when I was good, I walked in and went to makeup. Now this is yeah. a trick of life. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yes. <laughs> We're having an amazing conversation with the one and only Na Ashoko right here on the show. When I come back, asking her about acting and uh, how it's gone over the last couple of years. Probably her best role yet and all of this and more coming up on Hall of Fame. Tune in to Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My name is AJ Aquacos. I'm having a conversation with ace actress, radio personality, TV personality, and all round Mugulet, Na Ashoko Mensa Doku. I'm afraid of the words you use. <laughs> <laughs> they are very big. Uh, they are, aren't yeah. they? <laughs> but coming into acting, how, how did you find your way into acting? Oh, my way into acting. Hmm. The story. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll just make it short. So I, I accompanied a friend who was going to audition for Spiral Productions, a uh, Spiral Productions film. And when I went, they just, you know, they bring this list around and say, everybody write your name. Mm -hmm. So I remember Theresa at the time, she gave me the paper. I said, oh, I'm not part of. So I gave it to the person I came with. And she said, oh, but it's free. You should do it. Just try. And then you said, yes. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I wrote my name. They called me. And she also said Chris Atta was in there. Hi. That was that's it. Time, yes. I said, okay. Okay, oh. Because I thought mental. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. So I just, I just gave it a shot. That's really how my acting started. I gave it, I went in. They gave me a script. They said, act this. So I did. There were a lot of people there at the time. I remember the actors who were there. You know, real actors that I had been watching on TV. So I didn't think that I, I stood a chance. Yeah. But of course, I gave it a shot. And I got called. And I was given a script for Scorned. And months on, I was given a script for Perfect Picture. Wow. That's how, that's how it started. And then Perfect Picture 10 years ago, actually. Yes. How was it like um, shooting that particular film uh, 10 years ago? Uh, what, how was the production and how is it now that, now that a new, the sequel is coming 10 years later? How has the production uh, been on this one as compared to what it was 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, we were very young. I can imagine. No experience. No expectations. I had no expectations. I didn't know what perfect... I, I just knew it was a film that we were doing. And Jackie mm -hmm. Apia was in it. That, I didn't <laughs> know. Perfect Picture, when it came out and it became big, it was, it was too big for... I was like, okay, what's happening? Because it was just a film that we did. Hmm. And it had a premiere. I didn't even know what was going to... <laughs> so I didn't even know it was going to... I didn't even know about premieres or anything of the sort at the time, because we just saw films on TV and that was it. But there was a premiere. We had to travel. We had to go to London. Wow. I'd never traveled. <laughs> like, so had to that go to was Nigeria. your first time? That was the first time I actually got on a plane. So uh, it was just all very... Wait, wow, okay, what, okay what, what, huh, what, what's happening? Just all over the place. And wow. That's, it was just... And I was still in school at the time. And I remember when we were shooting, I was 19. 
but I think it came out when I was 20, but, you know, it, so it was all like, and then my classmates went to watch it and they were talking about it. Like, it was just so much. It was just big. Was that the role that made you a star or bona fide star, you think? I would think so. Yeah. I would think so because a lot of people, especially from outside of Ghana, who know me, know me because of the Perfect Picture film, mm -hmm. especially people outside of Ghana. Um, the film did very well. It was everywhere. I mean, I went to Sierra Leone and people were talking to me about Perfect Picture. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> I go to the States, I go to London, I go to other parts of Africa, and people are talking about Perfect Picture. So I think it was, it, Perfect Picture just did a thing for me. Now, 10 years later, sequel is out. Um, everyone's really excited. I mean, the, the queue to the cinemas are long, uh, waiting for an opportunity to watch The Perfect Picture 10 years after. How was the production? When, how did you feel when you got that call that, oh, 10 I'll years old, we're bringing it back? This thing has been in the works forever. Huh. So when we got the call that we're actually going to film it with production dates and schedules, I was happy. Mm -hmm. I had just come back from having my baby, my second baby, and I was looking for some, something exciting to come back to. Yeah. And this was it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this okay. was it. How was the production process? Meeting everyone again, seeing everyone again, getting like a family reunion or on set. It was nice. <laughs> you know, it was nice. Um, so after we did part one, for the want of a better expression, the first one, 10 years ago, we built friendship. You know, we met, we all met. We, nobody knew anybody. We all had all just met. I, I didn't know Jackie. Lydia had been with on the scorned set. But, you know, we had still just met everybody. I just now met Ajete. John Dumelo was, that was his first uh, real film. He was on a TV series called um, About to Wed mm -hmm. at the time. But yeah. the perfect picture was like a film, wow. you know. I, I stand to be corrected. You know, I did it. I knew him from About to Wed, you know. And then everybody, everybody on the set, you know, Jocelyn was her first ever TV appearance, uh, uh, movie appearance, Nokus, um, Chris Atto, <sighs> everyone was on. I know. So over there, we're all now trying to, everybody's trying to figure things out. Like, <laughs> okay, Ash, okay, let me do it like this. Okay, please, what should I do? Okay, <laughs> so it's so, all. So, but now we've grown, we've built friendship and relationships. So this was different. You know, like, let's do it like this. Great. No, how about we do it like this? Like, everybody brought something. And because we are older now, we have more experience. I think we are better actors. Um, the production company, Sparrow Pictures, have also produced a lot of awesome films. Mm -hmm. So everybody has grown. And so this was, like, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> from costume to, you know, behind the scenes, to the actual filming, rehearsals, understanding the script and appreciating the stories and getting into it. Oh. It was different. I like that. I like yeah, that. It I was like different. That. Now, over the course of the last, I'd say, 10 years, acting, um, putting, doing a lot of productions, being on top of all of that, and even stage, where do you find yourself most comfortable, on stage or doing a movie? On stage. Okay. Now, yeah. what led into the love to not only be on stage as a stage actress, but go into the creation of April Communications that's going to start doing their own stage productions? AJ, I love theater. When I was at GIJ, I used to go to the School of Performing Arts to mm. watch stage plays. I watched all of them. Name the play and I watched it. <laughs> I came to watch them twice and three times. And it's something I did alone. You know, I would just get up by myself and come to the School of Performing Arts and watch a play and go. Yeah. And I remember watching Daniel DeLong a lot at the time. And yep. I always, I, the first time I saw him was in the Diary of Adam and Eve. And I thought, oh my God, I could, I could be Eve. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was so nice. And I, I don't know how they're able to keep all those lines in their heads and just deliver it. And it was also magical to me. It, uh, people don't understand when I say it, but, but acting on stage, that's the ultimate public speaking experience yep because you probably have a script this big 
You know your lines yep. and everybody's lines. And stage acting is choreography. Because where, from where you stand to where you move to, to how you turn 360 or 180 is choreographed. You, don't, you can't just walk around on the stage. No. Every movement is choreographed. And if this, you know how I, I didn't even know this at the time, but I used to watch like one play four times, all the showings. And I realized, ah, he did it the same way. How did he do it the same way? Oh, like the when they punch someone, the punch is the same in the same direction. So I was very curious. So I got an opportunity to star in the vagina monologues. <clears throat> that was when I understood it all. It was directed by Amma Prempe, produced by Kareem. And everything. And vagina monologues is the ultimate monologue. Mm -hmm. You know, for regular plays, dialogue. So you say one line, say one line. You say one line, say one line. But in a monologue, you say 200 lines alone. <laughs> Nobody says anything. <laughs> only you. And you have to say it in such a way that it tells a story and people enjoy it. So it's hard. So from vagina monologues, I realized I could, if I could do vagina monologues, then you can do there's it all. nothing I cannot do. And then, I, so I started looking out to do plays. Um, I noticed there were a lot of new stories. Everybody does new stories. But then while working as an usher at the National Theatre, during the Ghana 50 celebrations, they staged a lot of old African Ghanaian plays, from Efo Kojo Malbev to Dilemma of a Ghost to, oh, you know, right. um, Amar Taidu's plays, and, you know, in the chest of a woman. And I realized, ah, so all these plays, why doesn't anybody do them? Everybody's trying to write a new story. But there are so many stories that have not been put out there enough. Hmm. You know, I remember watching The Dilemma of a Ghost and remembering this game we used to play in GSS. Shall I go to Cape Coast or to Elmina? Like, this is something I want to do. So I thought, why don't I see if I can do it? So I set up April Communications to stage African plays that have been written. So you, if you notice, the plays I do are from 1965, yep. 1980 this, 1970 that. They're plays that, you know, and you know, the language of those plays are different. Mm -hmm. The language, the constructions, the English is rich, is good. You don't get them in new books, you know. Their expressions and the wisdom, it's really deep, and I appreciate it on another level. Mm -hmm. So that's why, so I don't know if you notice this, but when we do plays and actors want to change their lines, she gets... No, <laughs> you are not. I feel like God just say what you know because Anna Henshaw writes a certain way, you know, Efa Kojo Malgbe writes a certain way. You know, Ama Atedu's lines are rich, just let's just do it the way they are doing. Don't say in it, in it, gonna, gonna. <laughs> Ama. I just, I, I can't, I can't. So, yeah, so yeah. So that's how um, Info Communications was birthed. And being a communications professional, um, you know, after GIJ, you know, I thought I could do more with it. So then we started doing, you know, digital marketing and, and so on. And now it's a full-blown communications um, company. I like that. Now coming to uh, the challenges in putting out your own place, do you think there, there's enough support for the, 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 the creative arts, specifically theater and movies, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, giving a, a bit of room for creatives to be able to do the things they love in an easier way? Well, you know, I would never have, have had a vim to stage a play at the National Theater if not for um, Uncle Ebo White. Mm -hmm. Uncle Ebo White started doing this after the Ghana 50 celebrations, long after the Ghana 50 celebrations. And unlike the Ghana 50 celebrations, his sets were modern. Mm. Because, of course, his, all his plays are set in modern, you know, in Ghana today. So I saw his sets and I thought, hmm. School of Performing Arts is small, so I can see how I can do it. But here at the National Theatre, hmm. How is he making money to do this? How is he able to do it? But then I realized, because of the quality of his productions, his shows sell out. I watch all four of his shows. Yeah. I remember his first play, Unhappy Wives, Confused Husbands. I watched it six times. Wow. Yes. I, I, I am, I'm very... Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you really get it. I, I can be very... Yeah, when I, I, when I, I can be very fixated on things. I, can be, I, I have this weird fixation OCD thing that comes with some things that I, I know. So I watched it every time. And when he restaged it, I went... And there wasn't a single day that the place was not full. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hmm, if you do good work, people will buy your tickets too. And they will come and they will pay for the production. So 
I realized that it really lies on the back of good productions like his in theater that gave the rest of us who came after him, you know, the push to get support from corporate Ghana yeah. to do productions like this. The creative arts is really private driven. Um, I think that we can achieve our fullest potential if we focus on doing, producing good work and getting support from private, like, you know, instead of relying on, on the government and so on, the government can create an enabling environment to make these things happen, provide infrastructure, like a good theater for us to use and so on. But driving it really is private sector driven. Mm. And so support, yes, we get support. Um, is it as much or is it up to what we need? Well, it can always be better. Absolutely. But we also have to continue to churn out good work so that we can build, install some kind of confidence in those who put their monies in what we do. Hmm. Yeah. I like that. Now, on to family and life and kids. You had, like, the most low-key wedding in human history. Like, <laughs> everyone went to bed one day, woke up the next day, and you were, yeah, your pictures were out, and you were practically married. Um, what went into trying to keep your family life as private as you tend to do? AJ, can I tell you something? Please. I don't know if I actually do take calculator steps to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I do. It's just who I am. You know, everything is on a need to know basis. You need to know, you will know. You don't need to know. <laughs> but, okay, so on a more serious note, it's just not really calculated. Um, I'm very intentional about most of the things that I do. Mm. I'd like to say all of them, but sometimes we all, you know. But I'm very intentional about most of the things that I do, and it's just the upbringing that I have. That's just the way we are you know, my family. So even before I started doing anything on TV or anywhere, I never really put too much of my, my family on Facebook or, well, it wasn't as active yeah. then as it is now. But it's just, I think it's just the way that I am. Um, I'm a very simple girl, AJ. I don't do extra <laughs> unless you're not reading my lines. <laughs> but I just, I just do, I just do what I need to do. So if I need to put it on blast, it will be on blast. If I don't need to do so, I won't. Um, hmm. The smaller your circle, the 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 richer your life. That's true. Yeah. I can agree to that. Okay. I can. I can. Well, we're going to go on another quick break. When we come back, uh, getting to know Na uh, beyond acting, but more into radio, TV, and how that career has spanned out. This is Hall of Fame. Don't go anywhere. You're tuning into Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My guest today is Na Ashoko, celebrated actress, radio personality, TV personality, and all around amazing human being. And uh, yeah, you are you are pretty amazing. I think I tend to think so. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the radio goddess out here. Hey. Uh, <laughs> where? Okay, so you have conquered the space of TV. You are known um, for hosting great shows, uh, reality shows as well and now you decide to make that transition into radio firstly what led into deciding okay you know what i think i want to do radio and i think i want to do radio full time and how was the journey on radio ha huh. so I tell you what i heard some kokonsa mm -hmm. that bulari was leaving joy fm okay i said what <laughs> bulari is leaving joy fm Bolare, I used to be a serial caller on the drive time when I was a, a little girl. You used to be a serial caller? I used to call him every day. Drive time. I tell my opinion on whatever <laughs> I had discussed it. I used to, when I was young, like, if, this was a long time ago. Long time ago, in the days wow. of landline. Yes. You know, our phone number at home was 711 Okay. And the Joy FM studio number was 711 So huh. sometimes when people were calling Joy FM, they would mistakenly call my home. And I was always sitting by the phone and I pick up and say, Hello, Joy FM, how may I help you? <laughs> what? Say, Oh, I want to help you. Like, okay, hold the line. Then we'll increase the volume on Joy FM. And then you'll be hearing it in your house thinking you are on Joy. Like, wow. I mean, that was, that was wrong. <laughs> that was very wrong. And I'm not proud of that. But so, and my uh, for, our radio was always on Joy FM, mm. you know, like through and through my forever since I can remember. So I used to do that. And I thought maybe I should also start calling Joy FM because it was fun. Mm. So then I started calling to the drive time with Bola Ray. 
And she said, hi, how are you? You know, we chat, to talk about important things. <laughs> and, and that's, so, so I was an ardent listener mm. of the drive for as long as I can remember. So when I heard he was leaving, I was like, but he can't leave. Where is he going Where to? Where is he going to? <laughs> Wherever Bolare is going to. I'm interested in what, mm. like, what it must be big mm -hmm. because he's leaving Joy FM, right? So I called Bola. I said, hello, Bola Ray. My name is Nashoko. Please, how are you? Please, <laughs> um, I heard that you've set up a new radio station. I want to work for you. And he said, oh, Nashoko, how are you? I'll call you back. He never called me. Well, for a long time. <laughs> and then one day he said, hello, now are you free for a meeting? Come over, let's talk. And I went. I was thinking, preparing for the meeting. Okay, when I go, I'll tell them that I want 30 minutes on Friday so that I'll talk about women mm -hmm. issues or children. Or maybe I'll tell them that I want maybe just like a slot like Uncle Lebo White has on Joy, the yeah. morning show. Okay. Pre-recorded word, now send. So I planned it all. And then I went to him and he said, I want you to host the, the, um, the mid-morning show. Four hours. You play me. I'm like, what? Huh? What? Who? Me? Who? How? Me? Every day? No, but I'm, I can't. I'm, I don't, I've never done radio. I was like, uh. he said, oh, yeah, I think you can. I said, okay. If you, you think <laughs> I can, then I can. Okay. That is how it started. And then we developed my radio show. I fell in love with it. And then I felt the need to do more and started a Star Woman Drive. Right. I felt the need to do so much more with it. You know, I had the segment called Every Woman where we talk about issues that affect women. I had the next 90 days where we talk about pregnancy. Wow. It was the next 90 weeks, uh, 30 weeks. So. I, I don't recall. I think it was the next 40 weeks. Talk about pregnancy-related issues. I found out so many things about women at the time. And it was just, I just, just basked in it, you know. I just, I took it and I used it for all that. I, like, I just made sure that I squeeze yeah, as much possible. as much as possible from it and then that is how my radio career started I loved it and then you know i did it for a couple of years two years going on three before i moved to joy fm so what led to the move there are a lot of rumors that circulated that well i took a long break to have my baby mm. you know so i i left the country i needed a break from work and i was pregnant so it was a good time to rest so uh, yeah, I took a long break. So somebody else did my show while I was gone. KOD mm -hmm. did my show while I was gone. I, I didn't come back till about seven months or eight months after. And you know how radio and TV is. You know how this job is. Right. People get used to someone, and then if the show does well, you, you the person grows on it. It grows on you. And so that's that's what happened. KOD did my show. When I came back, I had to move. Okay. Yeah, okay. Basically, it was just time. And uh, what? <laughs> are we hoping to do what what is next for now Shoko? are there big opportunities are you coming out with more what what should we expect from you so i've been so excited about 2020 because um i just have a very good feeling and vibe about it i feel like um it's it's it's, it's a time for me to do all the many things that <clears throat> That I've been cooking in my head for so many years. Yeah. Um, I, you know how you know how we are. So you have all this perfect plan for your life. I'm going to go to school, finish, get a boyfriend, <laughs> do this, do that. <clears throat> so it, it's it's it feels the same for me. I feel like okay, my life has gone through a process. You know, it's to school, I work for some time, got married, I've had I have children. My children are growing. So I've worked for many organizations. Um, I'm looking to do more with my company in the coming year. I have a lot of exciting things lined up that I can't wait to show the world. I can't wait to show you, AJ. I, know. I can't wait for you to buy <laughs> in and be on. And so, <clears throat> so I, I took the time that I, that I took off to have my second baby to make a lot of plans for 2020. Yeah. And I cannot wait to show you. By the, by the end of the first quarter, I think I'll come back so we talk some more. Hey, I yeah. like that. Now, but even with, um, with motherhood, what are, 
some of the things that nobody tells you that you actually find out when you become a mother. They don't tell you anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell you anything. They tell you, oh, have a baby. You'll be fun. <laughs> Scam. <laughs> They don't tell you anything. <laughs> you find out. And that's one thing I would like to do something about. Mm. You see, there are conversations that need to be had. We don't have to go through things to know them. Yeah. We don't have to make mistakes to learn from them. You know, they say mm. you learn from your mistakes. Yeah, but it's not necessary because people will make that mistake before you. Yeah. So why don't you learn from their mistakes so you can be better? Yeah. That's, that's how I think things should be. So that's a conversation I've been really looking to having with people like the the truths about motherhood you don't see this mole right here yeah yeah did you know you get moles from pregnancy what yeah i have a couple of them yeah are you serious yeah, yeah it just springs up so th there's just so many things that they don't tell you um <laughs> it's just they don't tell you anything <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't even tell you that breastfeeding is painful it's a painful thing wow it's hurts physical pain like oh my ow kind of pain yeah like they don't tell you they don't tell you anything but as well, you, wow. They don't tell you. I can't say it. They don't tell you. <laughs> they, don't, they don't tell you. Just tell you the good stuff. Because the good stuff is really good. Like having the baby, like feeling the baby move, it's just a feeling that you can't describe. Feeling like going for an ultrasound and seeing your baby alive, like there's a living being inside your body that's sucking his thumb inside you. It's just. Wow. Like every time I saw my baby do that, he was like always sucking his thumb. I, you don't even see it in the ultrasound pictures and things that you see around. Hmm. You know, those things, you don't see them. Like, when you watch your belly and you see them push their leg or their feet, and, or you go do an ultrasound and the baby has 10 toes and 10 fingers. Wow. I know this sounds like nothing, but when you're, when you're carrying a baby and you discover that your baby's toes and fingers are intact, Chally. it's the most wonderful feeling. Hmm. Because when you're pregnant, you don't know for how the baby will be, if they'll be fine, if they'll have best defects if something that you did in the past would affect the baby if the day you fell down would twist the baby's this or that you don't know wow. so it's very scary it's a scary period while mm. it's exciting it's, it's scary so the good things about pregnancy is really good and it sort of makes you forget the difficult and hard things but it's difficult it's, it's important to know the difficult and hard things mm. so that when they're happening you don't go ballistic and like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So, AJ. That's a new project? It's got to be. I, I like that. Yes. I like that. What you need to know before you become a mother. What they don't tell you. Even you. Friday night. And uh, what they don't tell you when you become a mother. Yeah, I like that. I think I'll take that class if it becomes a class. Yeah. And then take lessons and take notes on that. <laughs> Not to say anything though, but you know. <laughs> but no, it's always a pleasure having you. I'm actually, I'm happy that I can finally say I've interviewed you. And then we'll definitely do this again You're in amazing. 2020 when you have yes. new projects that we need to talk Boom. about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always a pleasure. Thank and you. you're honestly you. one of the, the most amazing people that you can ever know. Not in this industry, I'm talking in general. One of the most amazing human beings you can ever know is Nashok. And I speak from authority. I love and, you. Yeah, I love you more now. Love you more. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> apart from our, our, our I, I don't know if it's a sister romance or because they call them, the men call bromance. it romance. But it, it is a bromance. <laughs> I we'll we'll just bore the word for the day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you had our bromance going on. Thank you for being tuned in. Today was another exciting edition of Hall of Fame with my guest, amazing soul sister, actress, radio and TV personality, and all round amazing human being, Na Ashoko, aka the Superwoman, <laughs> right here on the <laughs> show. My name is AJ Akwako Sambo. Special thanks to you for being tuned in. And fun fact about this, Na Ashoko's sister directed this episode. Shout out to my director, Paula Mensa Doku. And on that note, calling it a wrap, I'll be back next week with another exciting edition of Hall of Fame. Until I come your way again, keep watching City TV. Hey. <laughs>